Um, right. To introduce myself briefly, my name is George Billinge. I run a very small, very young company called Illuminate Tech. We do research kind of at the intersection of online safety and novel technologies. Um, but the reason I'm in here hosting today is because previously I was at Ofcom um, working on age assurance. And today is all about how regulators are driving forward this conversation internationally. And whilst I was there, our next speaker was an ever present influence in our thinking. Um, so Baroness Kidron will be familiar to many of you. She's the chair of the Five Rights Foundation, um, and she was the driving force behind the Children's Code, form thank you, formerly the Age Appropriate Design Code, um, which was adopted by the ICO and is now being looked at in California and all over the world. She was also very involved in the ongoing debates around the Online Safety Bill and Online Safety Act. And I think something that um, I really respect Baroness Kidron for is her child rights focused approach to policy making. So she views age assurance through the lens of really empowering children, not just restricting children's access to online spaces. Um, Baroness Kidron, I hope you were able to hear me for all of that. I, I was, and thank you very much. <laughs> Perfect, great. Um, I will hand over to you then. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and good morning and hello to the many friends and colleagues who I happen to know are in the room. Um, and I'm really sorry I'm not with you in Manchester. I had to look at what you're doing this week and I would have liked to be there, but I am actually promised elsewhere. Um, and this was the best I could do at being in two places at once. Um, my remarks relate uh, to the world, uh, to the digital world, and, and I am going to talk about age assurance um, in the full understanding that it is an umbrella term for both age verification and age estimation. And I, I hope that my, uh, my opening remarks will be about 15 minutes, and that leaves a little bit of time for questions. Um, so... Uh, with that, let me let me just start by talking about what age assurance is not. Um, age assurance is not a silver bullet. You know, some kids will always slip through. Some adults will find a way to pretend. Children and young people have very different levels of maturity, even at the same age. Some families think it's fine to push at boundaries. Others, not so much. And so whilst a lot of parents and, in fact, if I might say, a lot of politicians like to imagine that once we crack age assurance, all will be well. I think it's really important for those of us who've advocated for it uh, to be part of the new norm of digital life, uh, and particularly those who intend to profit from it, uh, it's really important that we do not overclaim. Age assurance is not a silver bullet. It is part of the solution, which has many parts. Um, age assurance is not an excuse to put children in quarantine. It's neither rights respecting nor developmentally helpful to create a false world in which everything is endlessly perfect. Um, probably uh, most of all, because we tend to disagree on what perfect is, but you know, while a walled garden may work for toddlers, we do need to develop a digital world that helps children climb the ladder of understanding, development and experience. Um, and so we can't put them in quarantine. Uh, now, many of you will be familiar with the work of John Hayton. He talks about the coddling of the American mind and he suggests that we're crazy to be so frightened of the real world and equally crazy to be so lax about the digital world. And, and while I share much of what he thinks, I am very keen that children continue to be able to explore, learn, fall over and find their way. Yeah. But the freedom I imagine online is quite different from the freedom to be bombarded by porn when still counting your age in single figures or having your interest in sport be slowly but surely translated into a focus on extreme life threatening diets. And, and I often, when I'm talking to colleagues uh, in the Lords, find it helpful to use Wikipedia as an example. You know, a two-year-old is not interested in Wikipedia, a 12-year-old might be. And in Wikipedia, there's a great deal that would, that would be challenging and some that is straight 
forwardly harmful. But the difference between Wikipedia and Instagram, Wikipedia and Snap, Wikipedia and TikTok, even Wikipedia and Amazon, Fortnite, Duolingo, whatever, is that Wikipedia does not lure children in and once they're in, do everything in their power to extract the maximum financial benefit from them. A child-friendly digital world will not and should not be completely sealed, otherwise it will not resemble the one that children live in or equip, or equip them for their road ahead. Age assurance that cuts them out entirely uh, misses the point. Um, and finally, on what age assurance is not, is it's not an opportunity for furthering the extractive commercial profiling. In 2022, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, X, and YouTube collectively earned $11 billion from under 18s. Using age assurance to profile for profit is unprincipled, unpleasant, and in the UK at least against data law. So, so that, is, that is what age assurance is not in my view, which brings me uh, to what age assurance is or could be. And I was really grateful for the words about, you know, about my view that children have rights and children need a world in which they are participants rather than prevented. So age assurance can be part of product design system that respects children's development needs. A design system that might check age to provide information in bite-sized pieces, default to high privacy, allow children to search rather than be searched, offer smaller and more carefully created social networks, less notifications, promote creative user journeys that are autonomous and deliberate rather than pushing and prodding children into social and commercial interactions for extractive purposes. Age assurance that supports the provision of a more robust uh, systems of monitoring, report and quicker address and so on and so forth. In sum, it could be designed part of a system that benefits the child. Age assurance can also be part of a system that prevents children straying into areas that are designed specifically for adults. Whether dating sites, gambling services, or unabridged adult content, some places and activities are just not for kids. Age assurance can be part of personalizing services for the age of the user. One of the most disingenuous excuses of the sector of the last two decades has been to claim that age assurance is too difficult at the same time as promising us that they could innovate to prevent disease, get us to Mars, transform welfare. And it's always felt to me rather pathetic from an industry that knows how tall you are, where you live, the makeup of your family, and likely how many steps you took in 2023 and where you'll next go on holiday. From that industry for whom personalization is a core business, um, that they claimed age assurance was an insurmountable barrier. Uh, many years ago, a young boy said to me, how do they know I like red Nike, but they don't know I'm 12? And my answer has been for the last decade, because it's not in their interest to know. Because if they know that they're dealing with a 12-year-old boy, then they also know that flooding his feed with porn or passing his image to an infinite number of people is not what you should, should be doing. So... You know, all of us know, all of you know in that room that there are new rules both in the UK and abroad and we've introduced the imperative to understand the age of the person you're engaging with or treat all your customers as you would treat the youngest. And, and let me really sort of state my position on this. The test is not whether age assurance has been implemented but whether the product or service is providing an experience relevant to the desires and development stage of those who engage with it. Most often, age assurance is characterized as something we need to put in place to stop children doing something. And indeed, sometimes it is. But the vastly greater part of this need is to have age assurance to stop digital products and services 
doing something to children. And I find it helpful to characterize it as a know your own customer measure. That way, once you know your customer as a child, you can consider all the many things you need to do to make sure you're treating that customer according to their age and development stage. Which brings me to the knotty problem of can it be done, which um, I think that most of you in that room uh, know the answer in better and more intricate ways than I do, but the short answer is yes. But I have a few buts. Yes, but it is tempting to use it to extract more than age. Privacy preserving age assurance is technically possible but we have seen over time how commercially tempting it is to give more than a token of age. Add in a country location, a gender, maybe some interests or links to others. And I think I mentioned earlier that using age assurance to profile and profit is unprincipled, unpleasant, and in the UK at least, against data law. And in something of a fair warning, it's something that we at Five Rights will be looking into. Yes, but doing age assurance properly costs money, both money to do and money lost by doing it. Nonetheless, making a product or service, service privacy preserving, secure and inclusive for children is in my view, simply a price of doing business. And again, I make the point that age assurance is in large part a know your customer something odd. Is there something odd on my screen? <laughs> Sorry. I don't, is that me or you? I, I think it's us. Okay, so long as it's you, I'm going to continue. Thank you. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> um, yes, but, in fact, I am here. I'll let me go here. Yes, but, it feels like a punishment for the good guys. Some of the riskiest places on the internet, often with very poor track record of respecting users' rights, including data rights, um, will do age assurance poorly, if at all. And that is sometimes said to give them a commercial advantage, which is why we need legally enforceable binding standards that mean only privacy preserving, secure and inclusive age assurance can be deployed backed by regulators who judge their effectiveness as well as their proportionality. And we do, in this world, need regulators to hold the companies to account if we are to have a level playing field on the delivery of child protection and children's rights in the digital sphere. And even if some bad actors, money-saving or incompetent companies appear to get away with providing poor or no age assurance, over time, it will be an, a necessity for investment or trade or for a financial exit to have decent age assurance. And I'd like to see legislators and regulators drive good practice by rising, raising the price of non-compliance. Yes, but some children will use VPNs, get around, borrow identities of sibling and parents and so on. Yes, that is true. But whether that number is 5%, 10% or even 30%, it still means hundreds of millions of kids across the globe will benefit from the routine use of age assurance mechanisms. And even those who do, not, who do get around age assurance the very act of doing so is important. And, and I, always, I think about it this way. When my daughter was a teenager, I told her not to walk through the graveyard that was a shortcut, but to walk down the busy high street that led to our house. And I know, and I have since been told, she didn't always listen to me. But I also know that when she did go through the graveyard, she took off her high heels, put her keys around her fist and ran like hell. It was a conscious act of trans transgression, conscious both in understanding it involved risk and conscious in preparing for that risk. And, 
And I think it's really important that we all understand that transgression is an inevitable and important part of growing up. It's part of the journey from dependence to autonomy. But for it to be helpful to children, they need to know what the boundary is. Delivering porn into the hands of primary school children with no barrier or hurdle normalizes it. If children have to cheat, avoid, or develop skills to overcome the barrier, then they know they're transgressing and what they then experience is framed by that knowledge. And then finally, the new generative AI models are a game changer. And I think that is indeed true. And that's something I'm working on currently. <laughs> if we have learned one thing from two decades of unaccountable tech, it's that privatizing the benefit and outside, outsourcing the human cost makes a toxic world for the majority. AI models need to be designed to respect kids from the outset, and that will be a new frontier to our battle. And rather than allowing those who profit from the tech to say that it will all move too fast for us to keep up, we should produce regulation for age assurance that is tech neutral and future proof based on outcomes and allowing companies to innovate to meet them is the only sustainable and in the long run effective regulatory path. Now, I hope, and I'm sure you will have a very practical and productive week. Uh, and I suppose I would encourage you all uh, to go to a um, workshop on Friday about building consensus because I do not underestimate the resistance and voice of the naysayers. And I hope that you'll join Leander and Duncan to help chart a path forward to what good looks like. It's also why I hope that at the heart of your discussions is not simply age assurance, but the need for a holistic privacy preserving and rights respecting digital world for children and work out what part age assurance could play in that bigger picture. Because I, if I have learned only one thing in my political life is that you must fight for the optimum. Because by the time the compromise has been compromised on, it is no longer worth fighting for. So if the result of all our collective effort is that kids are locked out or age assurance is used to further commodify childhood, or teens and tweens are put into spaces that do not understand or response to, respond to their evolving capacity, then the fight is not won. I'm really excited to see the first steps with IEEE 2089, and, the, and I know that the ICO standard is, is on a way. I would love to see a plan for certification bodies to develop robust and principled testing processes, as, a, uh, as one of the outcomes of the conference. And I urge you to keep pressure on government and regulators to require all companies using age assurance to use systems that meet standards. And we've got to make sure that we're committed not simply to developing age assurance, but to building the digital world that children and young people deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Baroness Kidron. Um, I think we have a mic moving about the room if we have any questions. There's one here at the front. Thank you. I, I think I'm speaking to the room, so you can see me beeping. <laughs> Hi there. Um, we've had a session this morning with Mark Bentley where he showed us videos of children saying that most important to them is socializing on social network platforms. Some of them were asking for social media platforms that are addressed especially to children. Um, and we know uh, from, from the work on General Command 25 to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, children also have the right to peaceful assembly and association, which also applies to the digital world. So my question to you, Bieben, would be, what do you think about building social networks that are especially for younger age groups or should they be given the opportunity to also have 
peaceful assembly and association with other uh, age groups, so not only with their peers uh, and family. Thank you. I, I mean, this is a very um, uh, personal response, but I, I think that definitely, uh, you know, having contact with your friends and your immediate community is very important, but a lot of the young people that I speak to actually also want to have uh, more contact in real life and feel that they are nudged and pushed and don't know how to get out of the system of always meeting in online things. They don't have another reality. So I think there's two parts of it. One is that we have to invest more in 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 the fabric of children's lives because we've sort of pulled them frighteningly off the off the street. We've got rid of the parks. We have we pushed them in these spaces, and now we're saying oh, these spaces are no good. So I think there's one piece which is actually a real world problem about what we invest in children. I think to the other end, and what I th I believe you, the intention of the question is, is I actually think it's very much about uh, private and public. So I think that there are two issues for younger children being in adult spaces. One is if they can be pulled into private spaces where nobody knows they are and things go on totally unwitnessed. So I think that that sort of um, those sorts of uh, networks and assemblies have certain level of problem. And then I think there is an overexposure problem where somebody's in their bedroom and, and, and they are not cognizant of the full impact of doing something that then may go to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, between those two things, I absolutely believe that kids, and particularly older kids, uh, should be part of civic and public life. Uh, and I just think it's really about, you know, how much you are, um, how much you are exposing them, and and I mean that both in terms of safety, like their bedroom, their school badge, their name, their address, their, you know, their body, the, how much you're exposing them. Um, and how much, um, how much, uh, you know, you are supporting their engagement. And I think the technology can do either. So it's simply a question of how it's designed. We've got a hand over here, Becky. Hi, I'm not sure whether there's any cameras or anything. Um, I'm Frank Hersey, I'm a reporter at MLEX. And um, I've got a couple of questions on regulation. You've mentioned regulation um, a couple of times. So I was wondering, um, since the Online Safety Act's come in, we've heard a, a couple of things from Ofcom on, um, they're thinking that companies don't seem to be on track yet. Obviously it's still in the implementation stages, but I wondered if you had any original thoughts on how the Online Safety Act is going. And also you, when you were talking about generative AI, um, I wondered whether you might have another age-appropriate design code in mind for tackling that or amending the existing one. Um, on the on the second part of the question, I couldn't possibly say, but I might have been working on something this morning in in that in that vein. Um, on 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 the first part, I mean, I, you know, I don't know what um, Ofcom have said to you this morning. I I think it is. Uh, I think both Ofcom and the ICO have uh, have uh, a responsibility to drive um, this agenda forward. I hope I made really clear uh, uh, that my view is it should be a mixed economy based on standards and that it should be appropriate uh, to the situation, that we mustn't be locking kids out and... and uh, 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 willy-nilly just because that might be a bit easier um, and I and what I hope from the regulators is actually uh, that they are very very uh, fierce in pushing um, in pushing companies to invest and 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 you know invest in their systems and that they take a view on, not on how much in financial terms, but in how creative and how completely they have tried to make their services fit for children as their regulatory bar. 
rather than just the age assurance itself. And, and I really do hope that they're not taking, um, you know, they're not taking too much account of the idea that it's too difficult. Too difficult is only about expense rather than about technology. And, and the room that I'm talking to knows that more than most. Thanks very much. I wonder if I could hijack the mic for a bit to ask a question. Um, you mentioned the, the kind of key indicator of success almost is that children have access to experiences which are relevant to not only their developmental stage, but also their desires. Um, I think there's a lot of research out there which suggests kids are aware of the amount of harm online and want to have experiences online where they don't encounter that harm. But at the same time, there's kind of a tension where kids want to be adults, right? Kids want access to secret spaces and grown up experiences. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how we communicate the benefits of age assurance to children in a way that makes them kind of more willing and happy to accept um, that that is part of their online experience? I mean, that's that's quite a complicated question. I think um, I, th I think some of it is we've got to stop seeing the world exactly as it is and imagine what it what it could or should be. So, yes, um, you know, um, you know, this is this shows how long I've been doing it. But I remember right at the beginning of my journey with all of this, um, I was in the room watching um, uh, two young girls on chat roulette. Yeah. Um, you remember the era of chat roulette. I think it must have been 2012 or something. And and and, you know, yeah, they were they were giggling about willies, you know, and, and off they go. The question is that once they've done that, should they be automatically then inundated with links to porn and per people, you know, private messaging and da 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 da? And I think there is a balance, and I, and I sometimes make myself very unpopular by saying there is a is a balance between, you know, uh, youthful jollies, a little bit of transgression, and a family that kind of you know, slightly avoids a, you know, a, a film rating versus one that is very, very officious about it. Um, and all of those things play in. But what, what I find the fundamental problem is, is around what is recommended, what is pushed, and how the capture, yeah, it, it takes place. So, you know, the endlessness and the addictiveness of the loops. Um, and I won't go into the whole thing here, but I think that that if you if you detoxify and you take the pressure out and you go back to a world in a funny way, a, a web 1.0 version of you know of how you access and are accessed, um, you get into a place which is actually much more balanced because you're not pushing all this rubbish on kids. They do do a little bit of, you know, whatever they do for good or ill, uh, and they can come back from it in a way that is not, you know, I, I mean, I actually just find it offensive that 21st century society is is built on the idea that you hound children um, with experiences, material and, uh, and, uh, and dopamine rushes uh, to get their undivided attention. Children need a lot of things to grow up and only one of them is, you know, is online. Um, so so I, I don't know whether I've been clear enough, but but I, I do think there is a balance and the balance is perverted, not by the children, but by the current state of play. And so that's what I am asking from the regulators. Yeah, be really fierce about the age assurance, but really much more important to be fierce about what the experience is and let the age assurance take its place. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question, if we've got any in the room. If not, there's, there's was there a question back there? No? Okay, there's, there's one more online, which is um, kind of similar to the last one, but how can we avoid walled gardens or unfair restrictions? 
Listen, you know, I think that one of the things that I said in my in my remarks is just how valuable uh, children are to the companies. They're really valuable on a very extractive uh, basis right now, but they are also uh, their customers of the future. And I think it's an enormous market. And uh, if some companies decide to abandon kids um, and others decide to only do wall garden for very young, young kids, I think we'll see a lot of innovation in the middle bit, tweens, teens, older, uh, you know, older young people who are approaching adulthood and and on the cusp, you know, on, you know, both both sides of adulthood. And I think we'll see we'll see things um, that, that emerge uh, creatively and in business uh, uh, for them. You know, and, and, uh, and I also think that we have a whole generation now who do have quite strong views. And I think we are going to find, you know, in 10, 20 years, when, when this generation are adults, uh, they're going to look back and say, what the hell were you guys thinking? I think that's a, that's a motivational place to end. Um, thank you so much, Baroness Gidron. Um, we have a couple of minutes now to do changeover, so 